You and I are not the polite people that live in poems. So, you know what other movie it's been 20 years since? The gift of freedom that is yours by right! King Arthur 2004 holds a special place in my childhood, along with Troy, because I was on a hype train for the longest time. It had been filmed in Ireland, so there was a lot of press for it in my area especially. I'd fallen in love with Kira Knightley thanks to Pirates of the Caribbean, so this was my next chance to see my then future wife do her thing for two hours, and this absolutely wonderful Irish actor Pat Kinnevane, who'd starred in one of my mother's short films and I loved to bits had a role in it too. Mama Calloway knew I would love it. And I did. I left the cinema quite happy, but for whatever reason it wasn't a film we bought on VHS. Yes, we were still using those in 2004. And although I probably did catch it on TV at some point, I didn't actually see it again until I was a teenager. And despite me remembering loving it in the cinema, I found myself checking out, and even falling asleep during the big ice battle scene. And once I discovered the internet, I read all about how King Arthur 2004 was bad actually, and so that narrative was set in my head. There's a large number of lonely men out there. Don't worry, I won't let them rip you. I gave it another rewatch in 2019 when I was all about the Arthurian legends and learning more about them, and I think I came away from it going, yeah, it's fine and I can't remember if it was the theatrical cut I watched or the extended one. But the latter is what I chose for this year's rewatch, and my reception is much more positive. This is heaven for me. It actually took about four rewatches, some of them in parts, for me to finally make up my mind on whether this would be a lukewarm or passionate defence. So... Okay, it's really tricky to find a place to start with the Arthurian myths and legends because... Well, ask the average person about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and you will get different answers depending on how someone was introduced to the story. If we narrow it down to filmed media, for example, a lot of Gen X and onward had the 1981 film Excalibur as their jumping off point, but there are just as many who were introduced via the animated Disney movie The Sword in the Stone, or perhaps even earlier via the Broadway musical Camelot and its 1967 film adaptation. Younger viewers probably came to it from the 2008 BBC series Merlin, and there's no clear source to trace it back to, but the 15th century text The Death of Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory is treated as the definitive version, although some people will also swear by T.H. White's The Once and Future King that's a little more recent, but with how the myths and legends have evolved over the years, you'd be surprised how little consistency there actually is to some plots and characters. The famous love triangle between Arthur, Lancelot and Guinevere doesn't show up until the 12th century, and in earlier versions, Guinevere was a powerful sorceress or warrior queen, as opposed to the more delicate maiden most people think of. Morgan le Fay, aka Morgana, is best known as Arthur's evil half-sister, but her earliest counterpart was a benevolent mage who actually healed Arthur from the shores of Avalon. And her half-sister Morgos, likewise is now thought of as a scheming bad girl, but likewise was earlier depicted as quite a nice person. Hell, even the sword in the stone that proves Arthur's identity as the once and future king is not the same one given to him by the Lady of the Lake, but good luck portraying that in a pre-internet age and not confusing audiences. Arthur himself wasn't even a king in his earliest legends, merely being a very capable warrior or leader. And if we want some symmetry with Troy, Arthur is first named as a king in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, which created a founding myth for Britain stemming from Brutus, great-grandson to Aeneas, the founder of Rome, choosing to set sail at some point during the Trojan War to find a new land for their empire. He first emerged as a folkloric hero during the decline of the Roman Empire, created by the native Britons as a symbol of defending their homeland against foreign invaders, and this only increased once they had to deal with the Anglo-Saxons. So there is definitely a lot of flexibility if you want to make a King Arthur story that feels new and fresh, but that can also be a bit of an albatross, since everyone's definitive version is going to be different, and there's not a lot you can consistently expect. You can't even be consistent on the inspiration for the legend, because this 2004 film tries to claim that he might have actually been a real guy. Ancestrally named for the first Artorius, or Arthur. The film specifically suggests he might have been a man called Lucius Artorius Castus, but not only did that guy exist two centuries before the time the movie sets itself in, he wasn't even a warrior, and therefore extremely unlikely to have fought in battles that passed into legend. There are plenty of other historical inaccuracies that did not do the film any favours with critics, since it was marketed as the truth behind the legend and, unlike Troy, did not have the demythification or maybe magic maybe mundane thing to fall back on. It's a magnificent place, Rome. Ordered, civilised, advanced. 
It portrays Arthur as a Roman officer in Britain during the waning days of the Empire, which at least is a nice nod to where the legends originate from. His knights are Sarmatian conscripts on the verge of earning their freedom from Rome. Merlin is the leader of a band of Britannic rebels, with Guinevere being his daughter and a warrior among them. Arthur and his knights must fulfil one last mission before they can be freed, which involves escorting a Roman family out of enemy territory before the invading Anglo-Saxons get to them. For reasons we'll get into later, Arthur is convinced to ally with the Britons to defend the land from the Saxons, and his knights fight alongside him. So why didn't people like it? And were they correct in that reasoning? I'm not sure what it was, but from the 2000s onwards, there was an obsession with making King Arthur edgy, and although the BBC series Merlin is the outlier with its more family-friendly tone, it still portrayed Arthur as a spoiled prince who a young Merlin has to guide and mentor to ensure he becomes the benevolent king in the future, and these actors really were way too good for this material. Especially you, Katie McGrath. Only a madman hears the truth as treason. Around the same time, we got an attempted Rudy nudie take called Camelot that easily had the worst Arthur, portraying him as a man-child who's literally introduced stealing his brother's girlfriend and just has to get with Guinevere literally right before her wedding to one of his knights. It didn't help that he was portrayed by Jamie Campbell Bower, who would otherwise be best suited to Mordred, or even Kay with his bad boy vibes, and the series was carried by Eva Grain as Morgan, but cancelled after one season. It was a mistake, you got carried away! Then when Once Upon a Time Season 5 came along, the first half involved an arc set in Camelot, where, twist, Arthur is the villain in a clear attempt to recreate their well-received Season 3 arc with Peter Pan as the baddie. Except it was easily the worst storyline the show ever did, albeit more for decisions involving this character, and Liam Garrigan was way too good for this role. And what if I can't? And this marked the show's proper downfall in quality after a very polarising fourth season. And then on film, we got Guy Ritchie's King Arthur Legend of the Sword, starring Charlie Hunnam in the role, and you know it's edgy because they got a guy who was best known for a series about motorcycle gangs, and Arthur's knights start out as medieval versions of London gangsters. And while Guy Ritchie had done wonders with Sherlock Holmes, the sow's ear did not get turned into a silk purse this time around. Finally, there was a Netflix series called Curse, focused on Nimue, the Lady of the Lake, but featuring Arthur as a very flawed bad boy mercenary who has virtually no resemblance to his canonical counterpart, and the tonal inconsistencies, as well as overuse on cliches, meant that it was another series cancelled after one season. So this should spell it out. Audiences do not like edgy King Arthur. So it should come as a surprise that the grounded, gritty film touted as the truth behind the legend doesn't do that. No man fears to kneel before the god he trusts. Without faith, without belief in something, what are we? I mean, this Arthur may be dark-haired and portrayed as a grizzled war veteran, but he's actually a pretty decent guy. All of you were free from your first breath! This movie's interpretation of the sword in the stone is a young Arthur pulling a sword from his father's grave so he can rescue his mother from an attack on their town, and he enlisted not to get revenge, but because he thought the Britons were the bad guys. It was love of your mother that freed the sword, not hatred of me. He's also the only Christian member of the Knights, with his religion being a huge focal point of his character, again as a nice little nod to how the original myths and legends became adopted by Christianity as time went on. This is actually a very idealistic Arthur, who already starts defying Rome's orders to free a group of British prisoners in Maris's dungeon, and appoints a peasant Gannis in charge of making sure the people are taken care of. The turning point for his character comes when he learns that Pelagius, the churchman who mentored him, was branded a heretic in Rome and executed, which makes him realise that the Rome he's been fighting for and wants to return to doesn't exist. The Rome you talk of doesn't exist. But when awarded his freedom, he instead chooses to stay and help the Britons fight the Saxons. And because he was such a good leader, the now free knights in turn choose to stay and help their friend. And once the final battle is over, in which two of them die, and they lost a third earlier on, Arthur isn't just sad because his friends died, but because he felt he deserved death more than them for fighting for a pointless cause all these years. And since it was his choice to stay and fight with the Britons, and they were only there helping him. It was my life to be taken! Not this! So despite this apparently being a grounded and gritty King Arthur retelling, they actually do a fairly honourable interpretation of art himself. Or maybe after watching these three dolts he feels like the freshest breath of air by comparison. My brave knights, I have failed you! Clive Owen is… fine in the role. This was the first thing I saw him in, but I'd say that these… Thank you for your honesty. 
Now fuck off and die. A Clive Owen at his best. And 39 doing love scenes with a 19 year old. Yikes. Historically accurate, but yikes. So while I can't say that this is the best Arthur, he's far from being the worst either. Bishop Germanus, friend of my father. The others? <laughs> Since even the extended version is only 2 hours 20 minutes, we just have 6 nights at the round table. Lancelot of course serves as our narrator, played by Ewan Griffith in the role I best associate him with. But if you represent what heaven is, then take me there. We have Tristan, played by Mads Mikkelsen, who probably never thought he'd have this in common with James Franco of all people. Gawain, played by Joel Edgerton, no notes needed. Galahad, played by Hugh Dancy. No longer Lancelot's son if we go by how he's only two years younger than Ewan Griffith. Yes, I'm trying to flex that I can say his name properly over all the bread tubers doing videos on Saltburn who can't seem to get Barry Keoghan right. Then there's Bors, played by Ray Winston, and because Percival needs a better agent, we don't get the third member of the Grail trio, and instead it's the lesser known Dagonet, played by Ray Stevenson. You must not fear me. Do not expect anything resembling their mythological counterparts, since we only have Lancelot as Arthur's closest friend. You who know me best of all. Bors, for example, has a collection of illegitimate children who admittedly might not all be his, when his counterpart only ever had one son and was known for taking a vow of chastity, and this characterization more strongly resembles Arthur's foster brother, Kay. Dagonet likewise was the court jester in his most famous incarnation, with other versions portraying him as a coward. And so, quite unlike someone who would pull off this heroic sacrifice. Gwen was also Arthur's nephew, but since none of his half-sisters feature in the story, it's safe to say that's out too. Tristan also has no doomed romances with two women who have the same name, and it would be too easy to write them off completely and say they're just there, but this is a really solid cast. How many did you kill? Four. It's not a bad start to the day. <laughs> Extremely good use of your Ray Winston here. This doesn't make him a free man. He's already a free man. He's dead. Hugh Dancy is also very fun. I've been underrating him for a while, but he's a delight in everything I see him in. I don't kill for pleasure. Unlike some. Well, you should try someday. You might get a taste for it. Mads Mikkelsen? Need I say any more? We're all going to die someday. If it's a death from a Saxon hand that frightens you, stay home. Ray Stevenson doesn't get a lot to say, but still makes an impression. We miss you, Ray. Brave boy. Joel Edgerton does get lost in the shuffle a bit to be fair, and that's usually why King Arthur tends to work best as a series, since it's often an ensemble and the knights get more room to breathe. And with an entire hour less than, say, Troy or Kingdom of Heaven, even in its extended cut, it doesn't have enough time to give everyone something because it's already a crowded cast. We are blessed and cursed by our times. Despite plenty of interesting female characters in the myths and legends to draw from, this is a one-woman show with Guinevere being our Smurfette and reimagined as a Pict warrior. The jury is out on whether warrior women were a thing in Pictish society, as there was a law created in AD 697 that barred women, children and monks from military service, but there are a handful of female warriors in Celtic mythology, such as Scorhawk, so you may draw your own conclusions. Some people would call that freedom. That's what we fight for. In this film, they were originally intending to include the love triangle, but Antoine Fuqua did some research and found out how recent it was in the mythology, so it's taken out. So you see, Lancelot, we are much alike, you and I. The extended version adds in a couple of scenes where Lancelot and Guinevere share a connection, but it reads more as Gwen trying to work out who she can convert to her cause. And according to the script, she's Merlin's daughter, so she obviously has her eye on a potential marriage alliance to improve their numbers. And when you return home, will you take a wife? Have sons? With her scenes with Lancelot restored in the extended version, it's more obvious that Guinevere is sizing up the two most prominent men among the knights. And her talks with Lancelot reveal he's essentially out for himself and has no future in mind, whereas she then learns that Arthur has his religion and a motivation to fight for Rome, and therefore is a man of stronger principles, so he's the one she goes for. I would have left you and the boy there to die. Gwen's function in this is to give the men a cause. Since they've been Roman conscripts for most of their lives, and Galahad even says this when they're told Rome is withdrawing from Britain. I risked my life for nothing. At the point where Arthur has learned he's been fighting a pointless battle for most of his life and dreaming of a place that doesn't truly exist, Gwen offers him the chance to fight for a proper cause and make a new home in Britain. 
I can see why you believe that you have nothing left here. So this is not really a love story, but instead a more realistic alliance between two people on opposite sides of a conflict, and find companionship in that. And even the, uh, <laughs> stuff the night before the battle represents Arthur having a moment of human connection that he likely hasn't had before, since he has been all about duty and religion, and was intending to go to Rome to serve the church when this was over. I'm not saying that this is actually some kind of epic love story, but I connect to it. I live, I promise you. Maybe because a love scene between the male and female lead feels ever more alien compared to today's chaste blockbusters. And for Lancelot, he admits early on that he would have left Guinevere and Lucan to die in Marius' dungeons if he had been in charge, because he's out for himself. But likewise, he can't turn his back on Arthur in the end, and it shows that he does care for Gwen after all, since his big character moment in the final battle is seeing her losing her fight to Sinric and effectively performing a heroic sacrifice to save her, demonstrating that this spirited and passionate young woman did have an effect on him, and he came to care for her. So while she can come across as a generic strong female character, she's actually got a lot more going on, and her presence allows things to happen that wouldn't otherwise. And yet you chose your allegiance to Rome. To those who take what does not belong to them. Kira Knightley described her as someone who is very calculating, even in a benevolent sense, and that she might have fallen in love with Arthur, but she wouldn't if he wasn't beneficial to her cause. I wouldn't say Guinevere is a role model, apart from being strong. As a moviegoer, I want to see women who are proactive and not just the girl in the movie, and that's what I'm interested in. As far as Guinevere being a role model, I wouldn't say that she is one. She's pretty cold and she fights a lot, and I wouldn't recommend that. The interesting thing to note is that there's not a single innocent character in the movie. They've all done things that are repulsive and disgusting, and each one is probably haunted by that, but it's what makes them more interesting individuals. So on the antagonist side, Merlin is something of one to begin with, since Arthur blames him for the raid that got his mother killed, but in this version he is also Guinevere's father. He does feel like a missed opportunity, since the idea of a normal man inspiring a mythical magician is enough for a film in its own right. And since Merlin didn't get added until the legends until many centuries later, they probably could have left him out and just had Guinevere representing the Briton point of view. Or well, this is my personal preference, but giving Arthur a half-sister on the Briton side could have been really interesting, and I just want to demythify Morgana or Morgos, although whoever they chose for the latter would not be able to top Amelia Fox. Arthur Pendragon, the great destiny awaits you. Stephen Delan is very compelling in the part though, and yes, I was on Team Stannis, so this line here gets not a lol, but a giggle, so I guess a G-O-L. We have all lost brothers. The actual antagonist is Serdic, the Anglo-Saxon, played by Stellan Skarsgård, and the real guy actually founded the Kingdom of Wessex. I think you should watch. I wasn't too wild about Serdic at first, since compared to the complexities on both sides in Troy and Kingdom of Heaven, he is just a straight-up villain. But then I read how Stellan Skarsgård chose to interpret him. He's a conqueror because it's expected of him, and he only does it out of inertia, having gotten bored of the whole thing, and it's only on hearing about Arthur, who is already fabled, that he gets a second wind. Finally, a man worth killing. Arthur is his first worthy opponent in years, and that gives him something to fight for, adding some nice symmetry to the movie's main theme of finding a personal cause. He even seems to be glad to die in battle, because it's at the hands of someone he considers worthy, and the peaceful life would not be in his nature. So his seemingly disaffected performance makes a lot of sense, and makes the movie feel more complex. You come to beg a truth. You should be on your knee. It's quite a decent villain to have in your historical action movie if you want to keep things feeling realistic. Since of course we can't get Alan Rickman for everything. And call off Christmas. The late Ivano Mariscotti is also very captivating as the slimy Bishop Germanus. If your men are tool of the Knights of Legend, perhaps some will survive, if it is God's will. How about that? I came into this video planning to criticise its cast and characterization, and then realised just how good a bunch they all are if you properly look into things. We have the word of Arthur. That is good enough. My criticisms at this point can only boil down to, I wanted more, gosh darn it. You know what else I didn't appreciate? Of course, expecting a child to appreciate good visuals in a film would be a tad cruel, especially in light of how 2000s films really just look better in comparison to a lot of today's blockbusters, where we've now switched to digital, and blockbusters tend to desaturate everything, so stuff that was still shot on film tends to look more vibrant by comparison. 
but King Arthur 2004 is presented as the grounded, gritty take on the legends, but it is gorgeous to look at. While Troy and Kingdom of Heaven have the upper hand in being set in warmer climates with fancier architecture, allowing for beautiful shots of sun-kissed buildings and female characters in dazzling costumes, King Arthur is set in Britain, and filmed in Ireland, which depresses me to look at 70% of the time, and the majority takes place in the wilderness. But even these scenes and fields that are meant to look grubby are still extremely atmospheric. The mist contrasting with the green grass is beautiful on camera, and scenes in the snow, like this shot of Guinevere walking through the forest to meet Merlin. Likewise, there's an entire battle on a frozen river with this blue tint that I just love. And I think that ties into what the movie is trying to present to us. Is there nothing about my land that appeals to your heart? After all, Gwen in the extended version talks about how Britain is heaven to her, and while it's initially portrayed from the Roman perspective, and they viewed it as a bleak land of savages, Arthur and his knights eventually choose to make it their home, and so the visuals show us the beauty that can be found in such a place. And while it is attempting a realistic take on King Arthur, it's also going with the truth that inspired the legend, so things are shot in a way that sort of turns the mundane into the mythical. Yes, I'm very proud of that line. The battle scenes are of a certain quality as well. In contrast to the more operatic and spectacular style to what we see in Troy, there's a faux realistic tone to this. Again, it keeping with the idea of the truth that inspired the legend. I say faux realistic because at one point Tristan shoots five arrows and manages to hit a different target with each one. The best battle sequence is of course the memorable second act set piece where Arthur and his knights plus Guinevere have to face 200 Saxons on a river that is beginning to crack. Fall back! Prepare for combat! And Dagonet goes out smashing the ice and ensuring more Saxon casualties, because if you're going to be the first one killed off, you may as well do it in style. Ah! <laughs> Producer Jerry Bruckheimer reportedly bragged that this scene alone was worth the ticket price, which… fair. Pull back! The final battle is great too, and exactly what you'd want from this sort of movie. Although the duel between Arthur and Serdic is the main event, I gotta say, I really enjoyed the one between Lancelot and Sinric that ends in a mutual kill that actually got me to go… Oh. Too bad we didn't see enough of Galahad on the battlefield, though. Antoine Fuqua cited Akira Kurosawa as a major influence on his whole filmmaking career, and that is most obvious in here, where the inspiration from Seven Samurai is on full display, and 12 years later he'd be helming a remake of The Magnificent Seven, taking what worked about this and cranking it up a notch. And really, King Arthur done in the style of Seven Samurai and or The Magnificent Seven is kind of genius if you think about it. But that's all we got time for now. The second of these historical epics breezed into cinemas midway through 2004, and while Troy was more hit than miss overall, King Arthur was considered a miss. It was seen as a domestic failure with only a $51 million gross on a budget of $120 million, which of course doesn't include marketing costs. But its worldwide gross was $206 million, and that prevented it from being seen as a disastrous flop. The truncated theatrical cut was edited to remove most of the blood from the battle scenes, with the result that a movie shot intended to be rated R suddenly had to be cut to get a PG-13 rating, with Antoine Fuqua having to change his shooting style midway through production. The marketing choice to present it as the true story behind the legend saw pretty much a cascade of criticism for historical inaccuracies that dogged many of these such films like Braveheart, although that's more understandable for being based on a real guy. There was also some bog-standard Gen X apathy for a new King Arthur film that was not Excalibur, and the choice to set it in the Dark Ages. But the release of Antoine Fuqua's R-rated cut, with the film redone to be closer to how he wanted it originally, helped restore a lot more goodwill towards it. And there appears to be considerably more fans than its 31% Rotten Tomatoes rating would indicate. My boy, come on all my other bastards! I have to admit, the condemned in the court of public opinion attitude hovered over me for a while, and when I first thought of this feature, this was the film I was dreading covering because y'all know me and how I like being positive and constructive above all else. But after several rewatches and lots of YouTubing, I was glad I chose to revisit it, because there is a lot to be positive about. My father told me great tales of you. Really? 
It's not amazing, or maybe it actually is and I'll come around to that idea in time, but it definitely falls into the category of good actually. And while it seems the Merlin series may be the most enduring 21st century attempt at a King Arthur retelling so far, most likely because of the shipping potential, King Arthur 2004 does have one thing up on that and the other attempts at edgy Arthur, in that it at least provides material that the actors are not too good for. Pelagius told me once, there is no worse death than the end of hope. So I end by saluting my much younger self who came out of the cinema loving this movie and say, I finally see what you mean and understand what you loved. King Arthur! Yeah!